All right, so we're on. Okay, so this is uh, Kate Sumner interviewing Laura Balance in Durham, North Carolina, the Merge headquarters. Um, do you know the date? It's the 24th of April, awesome. 2015. Cool. Um, Laura, thanks for, for doing this interview with me. Um, I was wondering if you would want to start by talking about the family you grew up in and kind of your first memories of music, maybe. The family? Well, specifically about music or about my family? Because um, my family's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we can start with, let's start with your family then. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things about it that seem pretty normal. I thought it was pretty normal when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But um, my dad is from Hatteras, North Carolina, which mm -hmm. is a very isolated place. It's gotten to be less isolated now. But when he was growing up, <clears throat> there was no bridge to the island. Mm. There was no road on the island. Whoa. Um, to go up and down the island, they had to ride horses up and down the beach. Or at some point they got some cars over there and they would drive cars up and down the beach. Um, and my grandmother, especially when she got older, started telling these stories about when she was younger and, and um, they basically, you know, they were kind of scavengers, you know, and, and, and uh, she was talking about how they would get really excited when there were shipwrecks. Because, and there were a lot of shipwrecks right. in that area because it's sort of, it's the graveyard of the Atlantic. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, they would get excited when there were shipwrecks because stuff would wash ashore that they could use, mm -hmm. like wood from the ships and things like bananas off of, off of boats um, that they would never get otherwise. Um, so it was pretty, like, I don't know, weird background. Um, my dad was really excited to get out of there when he grew up. Mm -hmm. Though mo most people who grew up there stay there their whole lives. Yeah. Um, but he married my mom, who was originally from New Jersey, but had moved, her family had moved to Charlotte, and they would come down to Ocracoke, which is the next island, over, next mm -hmm. village on the next island, um, for summer vacations. Mm. And that's how my, my mom and dad met. They met at a dance. Um, and they eloped. And uh, both families were very upset about it. Um, and they started having kids when my, when my mom was 18. I think my dad was maybe 19. So they started young, mm -hmm. which I guess, like, back then wasn't that out of the ordinary. Right. But um, I feel basically like, kind of like I was raised by children, <laughs> or people who really didn't have a have a chance right. to grow up the way that I have. Right. As an you know, as an independent person before having kids, mm -hmm. they went pretty much straight from like living with their parents to having kids of their own to take care of, and. Um, I think that, like, some of their child rearing techniques were not the best. Um, they they at the, well, we had some bad stuff happen to us mm -hmm. later. Um, we my dad worked for Sears in the automotive department. He was a manager. And we moved a lot because he was sort of a, um, he was like an ass kicker. He would, he would get a store in shape and they would move him to mm. another one to like shape things up. And we were living in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, in this house that like basically the house, the whole it was like the Amityville Horror or something. The house the whole time was just telling us, get out. <laughs> um, weird things kept happening. There would be like thousands of snakes in the yard or or like the gas lines kept breaking and we'd be like, you know, have to leave the house because 
you'd smell so much gas in the house that like right. it was like okay can't be in here and my my mom would be we'd be sitting in the car in the driveway my mom would be smoking you know just like she didn't know <laughs> um but uh at some point one day i think it, it was july um there was this really bad storm and the house got hit by lightning um and it blew out all the appliances including the air conditioning and the house was kind of in a marginal neighborhood and we we wound up sleeping in in um, my mom and my sister and my brother and I wound up sleeping in the living room that night with the windows open and my dad was in the bedroom and a man came in the window mm -hmm. um, and he had a gun and he shot at us. He fortunately didn't kill anybody. I mean, it was, I don't know if, if I get, who knows what his intent was, but he, he was a serial rapist. Mm. He raped my mother, um, with all of us there. Right. And, um, it was very traumatic, <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it really, it changed my parents' relationship and um, it changed all of us forever, you know. Uh, I think all of us have PTSD and, and uh, they started drinking a lot mm -hmm. after that and, and their, their relationship was sort of some more stormy. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I sort of withdrew into myself. Yeah. Because up to that point in life, I guess I I didn't I had no idea that there were bad people. Right. I was I was eight years old when it happened. Um, <clears throat> and I just didn't know anything like that could happen. Mm hmm. And I also didn't really understand. I didn't actually see my mother being raped. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't really know what it meant, even. Right. Um, it, it wasn't until later I finally realized. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like from from when I was eight until I was like twenty eight, I was I was in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. Like I I sort of went through life kind of in a passive way and kind of um I was very open to suggestion mm -hmm. um or like I wasn't sure what I wanted um or didn't really I was more worried about other people than than me um and so I guess we'll get into that later, but but my family also, on my mom's side, um, sh her family was really into ghosts and spirits, and um, this was you know in the seventies mainly when all this when I remember all this going on. Um, my mom's dad. Uh, who I will from now on refer to as Pop Pop, um, <laughs> was really into, he was really into jazz. He was really into like reading Carlos Castaneda books, mm -hmm. um, who was this kind of like peyote in, taking, you know, mystical person who wrote books. Um, and um, he, I remember him talking about how he, and, and he was an investment banker <laughs> but I remember him talking about how he um, had a date to meet these men from Neptune in Times Square on a particular date and he talked about it for years and every time he would bring it up my grandmother would be like, oh, Bill, shut up. <laughs> Just stop talking about that. <laughs> um, but 
he he talked about it for years, but I think that when the date came and went, he didn't go, which I always wondered about. Like I never talked to him about it. Like why didn't you go? Great. What happened? Um, but it was just one of those silly things at the time that like like I I, I didn't think to bring it up later before he died. Mm -hmm. um, because who knows, he was also pretty f silly, and like, maybe it was an elaborate joke. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but very often we would have family gatherings at their house, um, where we would, we would drive and, and stay with them, and my cousins would come, who also lived in Charlotte, um, and they had this, this amazing old house, this huge house, it looked like a sort of a cross between a cabin and a Swiss chalet. It was, it was, I'm not sure when it was built, but it was old. Um, cause it had just these huge beams that you, you know, you couldn't find right after 1920 probably. Mm -hmm. Um, and they would all get drunk and get out the Ouija board. And this is, you know, while the, while kids were still, while kids were still up and about, you know, right, and um, they would be like talking to who knows what, who I don't know, um, that would say things that nobody could have known, you know. So, so I don't know. I grew up believing all this stuff mm -hmm. um, that that there that there are ghosts and there and and that you can communicate them and with them and but also things would happen in the house that couldn't ex we, you know that were weird right like you know you would sort of see things sometimes one time I I it was this was during the daytime one time I was at their house and was coming around this corner to go up the stairs and I look up and there's two figures coming down the stairs holding hands and I just turned around and ran <laughs> you know but but it was that was the sort of thing that just sort of like was normal right there um, so that is a brief look at where I come from <laughs> <laughs> when did you start to realize that that was the, the sort of eccentricities of your family? Um, probably not until I, like, maybe maybe in high school, but maybe not really until I got in college mm -hmm. that, I, that I realized that, like, that not everybody <laughs> has this kind of life. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and maybe that's what sort of got me started thinking about like maybe I need to try to see a therapist. <laughs> um, I don't know, but but my like I said, my grandfather Papa was really into jazz, so he he was super into music. Um, he he had a drum kit in his house um, and would play drums. He would put on his his like sort of hippie shirt. <laughs> and play drums. <laughs> was that his uniform? Was it like every time? Not time? every time. Oh, okay. But when he wasn't working, he liked you know he 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 liked to get out of his suit as mm -hmm. fast as he could, <laughs> put on his hippie shirt. Um, uh, and he you know he's always talking about his on his business trips to New York. He would he would always go to jazz clubs and and see different people play and he he would talk about it a lot and talk about people he saw play in the 50s mm -hmm. um, and mostly mostly at that point when I was a you know a young kid I was just like you know what is he talking about right peewee who yeah <laughs> peewee's a funny name right <laughs> um, but my parents were also into music. Um, they listened to, they didn't have a big record collection, but they listened to all different sorts of things. Like I remember my mom had some Broadway rec musical records and, and we had um, The Point, 
which was in you know in Nielsen and Ringo Starr uh, mm -hmm. collaboration where they Nielsen did the music and I think maybe I'm not sure maybe also wrote the story but then it was narrated by Ringo Starr um, and uh, my dad was into kind of acid rock and so he we we had um, mountain and cactus records and and uh, but also Peter Paul and Mary records and, right. and uh, it was sort of random what they what they wound up actually buying records of but like our their, their record collection fit in a cabinet that was like this wide mm -hmm. you know um, <clears throat> I remember my my dad would play air guitar to the Cactus Records, and I was—it was, was just—I remember just being like horrified. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. <laughs> and that—that that was when when I was like ten, you know. Right. I was just like, oh, dad. Yeah. That's obscene. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so when was it that you decided that, or? Did you kind of know that you wanted to be a musician? And when did that possibility come into um, mind? I forgot to mention, wait, yeah, that my okay. grandmother, my mom's mother, um, went to Juilliard, and um, she 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 played piano beautifully and sang beautifully. Um, I think that like whatever career she was going to have in music got sidelined when she got married to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. That was all out the window. And she was kind of crazy. Um, and maybe, I don't know, couldn't couldn't um, sustain, you know, working on a career anyway. Right. Um, but uh, I, you know, when we were living in Atlanta, I think, or no, it was when we were in Goldsboro. When I was maybe five or six, I remember going to a piano lesson with my older sister. Um, and I really had no interest in it whatsoever. She, my sister carried on with piano lessons and was more um, inclined to play music than I was. Mm -hmm. um, but we always, we always had a piano in the house, um, and I would mess around with it and try, you know, sometimes try to figure out how to play things that I had heard. Um, but I really had no aspiration at all to be a musician. Um, I enjoyed music, and w especially once my sister, my older sister, was in high school and started buying records. She was bringing all sorts of cool stuff into the house. Right. Um, I really enjoyed listening to music, but it, it I really didn't I didn't see where I I needed to play it. And and once I was in college or actually in high school, I started going to see bands play. <laughs> um, I was probably I don't know fifteen or maybe sixteen when I went to my first punk rock show. And I think punk rock is sort of the, the like the great equalizer as far as musicians go where like you're like, oh, you don't have to be good. Right. <laughs> you don't have to be some like virtuoso in order to play in a band. Right. Um, you can just sort of like make a lot of noise and, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It can be cool in a different way. Um, and so I started going to see bands play the first band I remember seeing was uh, Neon Christ and the Bad Brains at the Metroplex in Atlanta. Um, and I remember at the time just feeling really like it was noisy and loud and not like anything I had really heard mm -hmm. regularly. Um, I remember just being kind of like confused by it, like orally confused, and, and, and it's funny, like, 
I think that kind of music is much less confusing now. Like, mm -hmm. because everybody's kind of gotten used to it. Right. But at the time, it was, it, it seemed jarring and, and, and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But it's not anymore. Hmm. It's weird. Like, my, my daughter can listen to a Neon Christ, I mean, a, a Bad Brains record, and make sense of it. In right. a way that at the time, I, like I, when I went to see them, I was just like, "What the heck?" Uh -huh. <laughs> um, maybe the sound was really bad. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I kept going to see bands <clears throat> all through high school and college, and and it wasn't until I was maybe twenty. And I was working at uh, a pizza place called Pepper's Pizza with with Mac, who I wound up becoming business partners and merge with. Right. And he he was he had been in bands in high school, and um, he was taking a, he was going to Columbia University and was taking a year off, and was living in Chapel Hill for that year. And um, he wanted to start a band, and for some reason, he <laughs> decided that I should play bass, even though I didn't play any instruments at all. Mm -hmm. um, and he started coming to our house where I lived and teaching me and my roommate, Sue, how to play. Um, and that's how I wound up playing in Superchunk. Um, was you know we were we were in a few other bands before that, like we you know bands that started and then dissolved, right. just kind of for lack of interest. Um, but it was terrifying to me. I guess you know partly because of the trauma that I came from. I I really like it was not. I did not want to be in front of people doing this. Mm -hmm. I mean, even just playing with someone was scary to me. It made me sort of shake, you know. <laughs> and but playing in front of people was really hard at first. Like I'd get tunnel vision, you know, wow. where I couldn't. I would lose my peripheral vision and and uh, have this weird like shaky feeling, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I guess it's like uh, the PTSD just sort of kicking in. The, the, the you sort of, I guess it's different for different people, but it you you kind of um, it's like your your body you try to withdraw or something, um, but mm -hmm. Mac pushed me, and um, we we you know we started playing parties. We we, would, we opened for. Fugazi, one of their early shows at the Cat's Cradle, um, and I feel like it was, it must have been terrible. Like, I remember, I would just, like, get, get, um, lost, you know, in a song, like, lose my place and just be like, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And I remember Mag telling me, like, at some point in practice, like, if you, if you, if you, can't remember what to play. Just keep playing. Just make noise. Even if you're playing the wrong notes, right. it's worse to like stop. Right. Um, but I, I think I would very frequently just stop. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't until later I learned to just like, oh well, keep going. Right. Um, <laughs> but it was. It took years for me to become comfortable playing in front mm -hmm. of people. It took mm -hmm. a long time. So going back to kind of your early experience going to punk shows at the Metroplex as a teen, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what your experience was like as a spectator and fan being a young woman mm -hmm. um, and what that was like at the time. Um, huh. I, let's see. I think when you're a 
teenager, there's always some element of sexuality, like lurking in every situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like so much of your, your. As a as, as a teenager, it's hard not to have, to be sexual in, in some level, because mm -hmm. your hormones are being crazy and and. Um, you're around other teenagers and and I think for the most part like I had the this sort of repulsion thing going on with that kind of thing like I kind of like I remember the first time somebody asked me on a date I was like mm. <laughs> oh no right <laughs> do I have to hold his hand <laughs> <laughs> um, but I felt like I had to say yes because I didn't want to hurt his feelings, you know? Right. Um, but at shows, like, I felt it was, like, it was more, I felt like it was a pretty accepting scene, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, everybody everybody who was there nobody I don't remember feeling like anybody judged anybody else or or thought they were better than anybody else or or that there was a it wasn't like worse to be a girl in the punk rock scene in Atlanta at that time than than to be a guy you mm -hmm. know there were I remember you know a lot of times we would go to shows and then most, mostly hang out in the parking lot because we didn't have the money to pay to go in to see the show. Right. It had to be a show I really wanted to see. Right. But we would go and just hang out on Friday nights because there was nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there was a lot of just hanging around in parking lots and, and there were all these different factions, too, at the time. You know, there were the, the skinheads and the mods and the and the goths and everybody just hung out together there wasn't a separation or rivalry thing mm -hmm. like like in quadrophenia <laughs> or 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 in uh or or like it feels like developed later where right. it was skins versus punks or whatever it was all everybody was together we were all weirdos yeah. um and and it was it was fun and entertaining and just, you know, there were all sorts of different characters. And some people, some people did drugs. I didn't. Um, I felt like I was enough of a mess <laughs> that I didn't need to, like, I'm like, no, no mind-altering substances, please. I don't think I even really started. I didn't drink until I was... Until I started touring, really. Mm -hmm. Until I was like 21. Um, but yeah, going. I mean, the only thing, the only thing about being a, a a woman at the shows was sometimes things would get rough because there was a lot of um, slam dancing going right. on back then, um, and you'd be wanting to watch a band and then all of a sudden people would start running into you and you're like, ouch, <laughs> you know, right. and now I, I have to go find somewhere safe to stand right. and think about that, it, which, you know, it was a distraction. Right. Um, but, yeah. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um. So going back to you working at Pepper's Pizza with Mac and starting Super Chunk, do you want to talk more about kind of the evolution of that part of of kind of like how how did you get from uh, stopping playing in the middle of a song and not wanting to be on stage? to feeling more comfortable um, with that? Um, let's see. 
the first couple of bands we were in, <clears throat> we would play at parties at friends' houses. Um, and it was scary, even though I was playing in front of people I knew. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't, it wasn't until we did our first real tour um, with Seaweed and Geek. Uh, and I guess that was, that was 1990, I think. Um, that I was in a situation where I played every night. Right. Because before that it would be like, we have a show coming up in two weeks. Right. We're going to play that show. And then that would be over. And, and we wouldn't have another show for two months. And, mm -hmm. you know, repetition really helps your comfort level with these things a lot. It forces you to, it, it's easier to learn. Right. Um, not just learn the songs, but also learn from your mistakes or learn from, like, learn to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but also having these people that we were touring with, we were we were all really close and like basically it was like we were we were all just living together but moving around from one club to another and and um very often there would be nobody at the shows but us you know <laughs> we were each other's audience um and Aaron from Seaweed I remember at some point he was he he said something to me about like I'm tired of looking up there and seeing you looking terrified while you're playing. If you don't rock out, at least you have to put your foot up on the monitor. <laughs> or I'm going to jump up there and I'm going to knock you down. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, you know, he was nice. He wasn't going to knock me down. Right. But, like, he, 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 he applied some peer pressure. Mm-hmm. And was like, you know, you've got to, you've got to at least look like you're having fun. <laughs> um, and so I started trying, and eventually realized that it, you know, it was fun, and mm -hmm. and um, and it's really fun too to, you know, make playing music into this more physical thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I almost got more into that part of it than the playing part <laughs> of just like figuring out how how to like play and jump up and down at the same time, um, mm -hmm. and and it was really fun and it, and like you get all sweaty and there's something really gratifying in that and just like at the end of a show being like I am completely drenched in sweat and and you know. I jumped up and down, and the audience jumped up and down. Like, right. people respond. Totally. Um, and that, I think, is what the part to me that, like, you know, made me really want to play in a band was, was when things go well with the audience, you get something back from the audience that um, is really hard to describe. It's, um, it's a feeling... It's a like. It's also something really physical. It's it's it's, it's um, you interact with people, a group of people, and and they this this appreciation is just coming at you, and it's 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 addictive. It's it's beautiful, um, and if they start singing, it's even better, you know. Uh, and that started to happen after a while, you know, like our, after our first album came out, um, there were more people that were familiar with our music mm -hmm. and would come to the shows and, and it was, you know, we'd just have a great time. It was really fun. Um, I think on that first tour, Chicago was one of the better shows. This guy, Peter Margusek. Who, who writes for the, I think, Chicago Tribune now. Um, he promoted the show, and we stayed at his house, too. But, like, the show was great. There were tons of people there. I think people, back then, people also would just go go to all these shows when they had no idea who was playing or right. what it was going to be like. But there, was, there wasn't 
there weren't so many options all the time. So, right. like, if there was a punk rock show, people would just go. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, you know, there were a lot of people in Chicago who, who went out to these things, and, and it was great. It was really super fun. Um, yeah, so, so I think the physical distraction of jumping around helped me get over the sort of mental part. Right. The fear. Yeah. Of, of being in front of people, the stage fright. Mm-hmm. And so, what was it about music that had that pull for you, even through the fear? Uh-huh. You mean playing it or going? Um, I guess, you know, partly just that I had really enjoyed going to see bands play for so long. And the idea that I could do it too made so much sense. Um, and it gave me sort of a sense of value, it, a different, you know, having a different value in the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to try. I don't know. I mean, and I really easily could have quit and, and not kept with it because it was hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I was still in college. I had two more years to go. Right. And um, was trying to, you know, tour and, and run a record label at the same time. Um, my dad would have preferred. <laughs> that I quit. <laughs> but, yeah, I guess it was the fun. It was just fun. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, so, let's see. One of the unique things about your narrative is that you are running this record label. Right. Um, and so I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that and your experience starting in Merge. Um, <clears throat> well, when we started it, it was um, to, I think like, well obviously Mac had been in several other bands, was in several, he was like in five bands at a time back then. Um, so, he he had a lot of material, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was partly to we started it partly to release some of that some of that stuff, but also it felt like there was nothing locally that that really there was no there weren't so many record labels at the time. Mm -hmm. There was there was Discord in DC. Right. Um, and that was a big inspiration, um, but but it felt like there were all these bands that were good, these local bands that were good and would be around for a while, and then they would just kind of fade away because mm -hmm. there's nothing, you know. They would open local shows, but then they couldn't really get beyond that, um, and I think that you know bands have to have a sort of a progression to keep growing, mm -hmm. um, and. If you don't have any kind of uh, real, uh, a, a, a physical, like, a seven inch or something, you can't really, you have nothing to send to a promoter in Peoria or, you know, or wherever mm -hmm. in Chicago um, to get a show there. Um, so... We started Merge partly to document these bands, mm -hmm. but also to like help give them a, an opportunity to to become something more, right? Or to keep existing. Um, and I I didn't I really didn't think it was gonna keep going. I just thought we'd do a few things and that would be it, right? Um, 
I should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Uh, just because, like, I never quit anything. Uh huh. I'm, yeah, I'll just keep going at it. Um, and, like, if I do anything, I'm going to do it right. You know, mm -hmm. and my that's that's something that my dad told me at some point. Like Laura, if you're gonna bother to do anything, you better do it right. Um, and so that's what I do. And and um, yeah, like at first it was just cassettes, which I would dub on a dubbing deck in the house. You know, it wasn't like we were having the manufactured right. somewhere. I was like, you know, right. I can do it on high speed. It'll only take it'll only take three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it might not sound as good. I don't know. Let's see. Uh -huh. um, and and we and seven inches. Um, and you know, at first we were only selling them in local record stores. Mm -hmm. I remember for the first cassette making, um, it was a Bricks cassette. Was that the first thing? I think it was. Um, no, it was Wax. But on the, it was maybe on the, the, the Bricks cassette. Um, I have a, this is a, the, an early version of the discography. Wow. Um, uh, uh, I remember making this box, the display box that I wanted to be on the, the counter at, at school kids. Like, I took a cassette sized box and wrapped this red velvet fabric around it and made it into this thing where it was, you know, sort of like at an angle so you could see all the cassettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, I was like, here, you can put that on the counter and people will buy these. <laughs> I don't know if they did. I don't remember. But um, it's amazing to me that people bought any of that, mm -hmm. you know? It's totally unknown bands that sounded weird. But they did. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we started uh, developing relationships with, with um, distributors and stores in other cities. Um, and it's funny, you know, partly using the our the connections we made with Super Chunk. Mm -hmm. It was really like good um, sort of symbiotic growth, right? Um, because you know, being in Super Chunk, we got to travel around and meet lots of people, and really, it's all about networking. Being in the music business, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we wouldn't have called it being in the music business back then. It would have just been like, you know, being part of the scene. Um, but it, 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 it's, it would be sort of embarrassing to admit that you were in the, like, wanted to be, you wouldn't say you wanted to be in the music industry mm -hmm. unless you were, like, wanting to work for a major label. Right. Um, but, uh. We eventually, you know, started selling seven inches to uh, a lot of seven inches to Pier Platters in Hoboken, which was the store that was around um, back in the '80s and '90s. I guess mostly in the '90s. I don't remember when they went out of business. Um, it was a great record store. Bettina worked there, who um, runs Thrill Jockey. Okay. Um, it was owned by this guy named Bill Ryan, who I still am friends with. He's awesome. Uh, and like all the all these people that were in bands in New York work there. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great store. Uh, and I remember spending a lot of time talking to this guy Bruno, who worked at um, <clears throat> I think it was Cargo in Chicago. Mm -hmm. They were a distributor. And he also worked at some record store there, so he would take some into the record store. Um, but, it, you know, we had very few distributors, but, like, they were good. It was mm -hmm. good. And, and um, I was more... Mac? I think Mac was more... Um, 
focused on like the sort of social side of it and the the um know how to, like creative side of it maybe and I'm more businessy mm -hmm. like so so I wound up doing most of the sending packages to distributors calling them sending invoices mm -hmm. um, and this was all like kind of pre internet becoming what it is you know so right. everything was calling on the phone or using my typewriter to make invoices. Like I, I made a template for the invoices, you know, using a merge logo that we had had these friends of ours design and the lines on the invoice were like, uh, what do you call it, uh, like the underline mm -hmm. key on the typewriter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, we'd handwrite them in and mail them. We weren't emailing anybody. It was, it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was very low-key, I mean, or low-tech. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you didn't aspire to be in the music industry, when did you realize that you were going to make a living doing music? Um, I guess... Um, probably around 1992. So we started the band and merge in 1989. Right. Um, on this road trip. I'm going back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, when Mac graduated from Columbia. Oh, okay. Got it. I think it, or maybe he wasn't graduating yet, but some of his friends were graduating who lived on the West Coast, mm -hmm. and they came up with this idea that they we were going to take this road trip where we drove them home. Mm -hmm. um, and so we borrowed Mac's dad's van, which was totally one of those like vans, a conversion van, I guess is what you call it. Okay. Like, it was a family van. Right. Um, <clears throat> had an 8-track player in it. Um, we took his van, picked everybody up in New York with their stuff, and started driving across the country, um, camping along mm -hmm. the way. And um, it was fun. And... <laughs> uh, when we were in the Southwest, we went to, um, in New Mexico, we went to this Indian uh, archaeological site called Nagizi, and you had to drive down this dirt road to get there, and we were coming back to get on this little highway, and the van caught on fire and um, burned to the ground along with most of our stuff. Whoa. <laughs> and this also, you know, it was in 1989, and, the, like, nobody had a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, it happened to start, catch on fire right near the highway, and there was a little store there, and I think somebody there had a phone and called the fire department, but it took, I think, 45 minutes or an hour for the fire department to get there. Um, so... We, we weren't able to put the fire out, mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing, the, you know, it was crazy looking. And also, having grown up watching TV, when, when a car catches on fire, you think, it's going to blow. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, so we thought, like, it's going to get to the gas tank and it's going to explode. You know, it didn't. It doesn't yeah. go that way, usually. <laughs> um, the tires popped. Mm -hmm. But but the gas tank, I somehow, I don't know, it evaporated or the tank, the, the cap blew off before, you know. Right. Um, before it led to a large explosion. Um, <laughs> we managed to pull some of our stuff out of the back. Um, 
like our luggage. We got our luggage out. My eight track tapes were all burnt. Um, everything that was near the front where mm -hmm. the engine was. Uh, but from that, from there, we had to switch to a rental car. Mm -hmm. And so there were five of us in a rental car. And um, we had to ship a lot of our stuff home because mm -hmm. we had too much stuff. Right. Um, and uh, we went, the, the people we were dropping off were all like in the Pacific Northwest. And so we went up there and we, um, we had timed it to coincide with Sub Pop was having like their first anniversary. I think it was their first anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, a show at, I can't remember the name of the theater, some theater. We saw the Melvins play and Nirvana and I think Tad and got to meet the guys who started Sub Pop and, and that also was really inspirational. And like, mm -hmm. um, going back, it was just Mac and I, and mm -hmm. we started talking about starting a record label mm -hmm. on that trip. Um, and I guess had, you know, the, the Super Chunk started around that same time. I can't remember the exact moment, but it was in the same year, around the same time that like Super Chunk became a band called Chunk, not, not Super Chunk, but, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it had the forming members of the band in it, Chuck Garrison, uh, who the band was named after, and um, Jack McCook and Mac and I. Um, now I can't remember what the question was that made me start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was when, when did you think... When do you oh, know you make a living. Okay. Yeah. So I think I let's see, I graduated from college in the it took me an extra semester to finish. I, I graduated in at the end of nineteen ninety and um after that was free to like for the band to Mm -hmm. go on tour whenever. Right. Um, I also ha had a job at Kinko's who, um, I think Kinko's, at, you know, I don't know if they still are like this, but they have always been great about like being flexible, mm -hmm. about employees coming and going and tra leaving to travel and coming back, you know, right. so, so uh, several of us worked there at various points um, because when you're not on tour, you know, you need, you need a job. Right. Um, and the first few tours, we didn't make any money really, but then we started making money. You know, we'd come home and be able to pay ourselves something. Mm. We'd have some money left over. Um, I mean, not enough to live on, but, but eventually it got to be more. Right. And super chunk, much more than merch, like, and, We'd leave people babysitting merge while we were gone. Because it was basically at that point, you know, call cargo, see if they need anything, um, call revolver in California, and mm -hmm. check the P.O. box for mail order. Yeah. Um, and, and we'd go on tour, and, and merge would sort of limp along. Um, but Super Chunk became this big, bigger thing, a much bigger thing than merge. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were, our full lengths were on Matador at the time, mm -hmm. who had also just started around that same time. Um, but they had Gerard Kosloy, who was, had already been working at, at record labels before, and, you know, we really respected and trusted him and, and certainly felt like he was more capable of putting mm -hmm. out albums than we were. Mm-hmm. We were, you know, only oh, only up for seven inches. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, in 1992, Corey Rusk, 
the, the guy who started Touch and Go, who were a label and became sort of a manufacturing and distribution organization, um, reached out to us and said, you know, I really like what you guys are doing on Merge. Do you want to start doing full length records? I, you know, I could finance the manufacturing and distribute it. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, which you know, is really exciting um, and a whole taking things to a new level. Right. Um, and one of the first things we did was a um, a compilation of super chunk singles and outtakes, um, and that did really well. And then we did we did a Palvo record, and that did that did really well. To, I mean, to us. At the right. Time. Um, <clears throat> and I think it was after that between being able, you know, having a real distribution system and super chunk doing better and better that I that you know we quit our jobs at home mm -hmm. and just did music full time um, touring and then working at, at merge all the time when we were home mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't I mean I think our guarantees yeah, you know, we would get paid less than a thousand dollars a show. I think normally. Mm -hmm. I remember when we hit the one thousand dollar mark at certain shows. I was just like, "Whoa, all right, uh -huh. <laughs> pretty awesome." Uh -huh. But I also remember at certain points being on tour, and I would I was the person who would act as tour manager mm -hmm. and like sort of settle at the end of the night, and I had this bag of money. Like I would have my my messenger bag would just be like full of money. <laughs> like I think I remember at some point having like twenty thousand dollars in my bag. Whoa. Yeah. And it but it was hard to get rid of it. Like there was there was it, there wasn't an easy system for um and you didn't want to take checks from anybody. Because okay. they would bounce, you know. Right. Like you wanted to make sure you you actually got paid. Right. Um so, like, I'd be carrying around this huge amount of money, and, and it was hard to deposit it at the bank. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of time, and they, they, like, it wasn't until later that, like, there was a, a, a network of banks where you could actually, like, find your bank right. and deposit it there right. when, in another state. Right. And it was all, it, was, it, would, it would take an hour. Like, it would really take a long time because they were suspicious of you. Right. And they had to, like, do all sorts of checks to make sure that you weren't, like, I don't know, hadn't just robbed somebody. I don't know. Right. What, I don't Different know what they think. were Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, but I, re I remember at some point, like, looking at Jim, who, who, who's also in Super Chunk, um, he drove a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at him, going like, we could just like, we could just start a new life with all this money. I mean, we can just like disappear and, you know, put a down payment on a house. Right. Because at the time, like that was a, I mean, really right. a lot of money. Um, we also used to joke about how we could be serial killers, the way we just like drive around and nobody really like knows where you are. Right. Um, but we weren't. <laughs> we never killed anybody. <laughs> Good to know. I can't, and like the form said, I can't stop the subpoena. So. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was interesting. And another funny, like, sort of low-tech thing was, like, if you got lost, if you couldn't figure it out on your map, Mm-hmm. You had to find a payphone and call the club who probably weren't there and maybe maybe there wasn't even a phone at the club. You know, right. we'd call our booking agent and be like, Can you help us? Right. <laughs> we don't know where we are. Or we're gonna be late. Will you will you get in touch with the club and tell them we're gonna be late? Um, 
but we'd have to, you know, it, and then like, it was early, it was, it was, it was early enough, even like calling cards were difficult to make function correctly. Mm -hmm. Uh, but so anyway, once we were carrying around $20,000 at a time, I, it, it, it's, we were, we were like at a point where we'd come home from tour and be able to pay ourselves enough that like we were living off of it. Right. We weren't rolling in it or anything, but, but sure. we were, we were able to live. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, so... You meet Macron in the band, and you're in a relationship with him for a period of time. Um, I was curious how being in a relationship with another person in the band impacted the perception of your role in the band. <clears throat> I don't know how much, well, it's possible that early in the development of the band, when I was especially not good at playing, mm -hmm. people may have been going like, why is she in this band? Right. It must just be because she's Mac's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why would he put up with this? Mm -hmm. And I agree. Because <laughs> I was terrible. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but there was definitely, I remember early on, a lot of um, unrelated to... Mac and my relationship, just like we'd show up at a club and people would assume that I was some hanger-on and not someone in the band. Right. Um, just things that, pe you know, that people were, that worked at the clubs would say. I, you know, I can't really remember anything specific, but I remember just feeling like, er. Yeah. Um, because people didn't expect women to be in bands. I mean, there were, there were bands certainly around at sure. the time with women in them, a, you know, a good number of them. There was unrest. There, there was, um, versus, um, and we did a bunch of shows with the faith healers. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, there were a lot at Stereo Lab was going around, mm -hmm. I, you know, at some point. I can't remember when, you know, it's all this funny right. continuum. It's hard to sure. remember what year it was. Um, but, but yeah, it was it was it was not the norm for women to be in bands, and people would say things without thinking about like, oh, the T-shirt stands right over there. If you want to set up, you know, I'm not selling T-shirts, right? <laughs> or I will be after the show, but not wearing it, right? <laughs> um. Uh. But I think the the. Us being in a relationship, you know, it, it, the worst part was when we weren't, when our relationship ended. Right. Um, and that was more internal, you know, mm -hmm. the difficulty. Um, I, I, I feel really bad for the other people in the band. During that time, they just, they must have just been like, you know, oh my God. Because <laughs> we, we just were, you know, at each other. Right. Um, and it's, it's amazing we made it through it and I'm glad we decided, you know, when we broke up, we decided that we didn't want to break up the band and that we wanted to keep Merge going. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, just hoped that we would be able to work through the difficulty of right. breaking up. Um. But, but yeah, once, after that first part, I don't feel like people, there, you know, that our relationship really, oh, maybe this isn't right. I mean, I think a lot of people thought of the band in terms of he and I being in a relationship mm -hmm. for a while. Right. Maybe. And it felt like a lot of the songs were about our relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, Though, Mac would, Mac doesn't like anybody trying to figure out what his lyrics mean and trying to say what they mean. So, I could be completely wrong. Right. And he wouldn't tell. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, 
how did you work through that transition period? It was ugly. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, you know, being jealous and being like, um, being on tour and him like disappearing with someone and just being like, wait a minute, ew. Mm hmm. Really? <laughs> um, and then, like, right. <laughs> uh, And I think, I think, you know, I was young, and I think at that point, and you're not very logical, you know, like, I didn't want to be in a relationship with him anymore. What, what did I care? Right. But I did. Uh-huh. Um, and I think it, it just took time. It just, mm -hmm. like, time had to pass for us to get to this point where these, these things weren't fresh anymore mm -hmm. and didn't feel so hurtful. Right. Yeah, it really speaks to the importance of Merge and Super Chunk to you, though. Yeah, definitely. I felt like like they were bigger than us. Mm -hmm. And they, at that point, you know, by the time we broke up, they had both developed to a point where it felt like they needed to keep going. Mm -hmm. They weren't smaller than our relationship. They, they were bigger than our relationship. And I mm -hmm. felt like Merge, especially, was really my baby. Mm -hmm. I... I um, I felt like, you know, especially, you know, Mac was away at school, and I really, I did it all mm -hmm. for the first few years. Um, he would, he would talk to Bill Ryan when he'd go to Pierre Platters and send me orders sometimes, but like, really, the first few years, I was doing, doing all the Mm -hmm. the nuts and bolts of merge right. and um, yeah I didn't I didn't want to let that go mm -hmm. but also I really did feel like I couldn't go like well you take super chunk and I'll take merge right right <laughs> we'll split up the children yeah <laughs> um, it it like we are both essential parts mm -hmm. of merge like he's He's the, the, we're the yin and the yang. It, mm -hmm. it, it works together somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think about how painful the, the working together after the breakup was. And, and I... Really? I want to remember it and try to figure out a way to explain it to my daughter mm. when she gets to this point where she's breaking up with somebody and she feels like it's the end of the world. Right. Because... It really, like, it's not until you, I don't know when, what age you get to be, or maybe ne some people never do, where you realize, like, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's just people. There's lots right. of people. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's sad when things don't work out, but, but yeah. It's not the end of the world. You're going to be all right. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned your daughter. A lot of our narrators have talked about their experience with motherhood and working and mm -hmm. music. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to your experience with that. Um, I feel like having, having my daughter changed everything. Like it changed what was important. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing more important than her. Mm -hmm. um, and it changed how I felt about touring. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, I don't think, I know a lot of people bring children on tour with them. Mm -hmm. I think maybe if you're doing really well as a band and you have a bus and you can like hire a nanny and do all sorts of stuff, maybe it makes sense then. Right. But it, for Super Chunk, for me, it did not make sense anymore to tour once mm -hmm. I had a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't going to bring her with me, and I couldn't leave her. Right. Um, especially especially when she was younger. I mean, now I, I can imagine, you know, I can, I can see going away for a week. 
And we did. Mm -hmm. Like, what in 2010, we put out Majesty Shredding, and I think we were gone for, like, 10 days or 12 days at a time. Mm -hmm. um, I... But, but playing in the band became less important to me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, But also, like, on the other hand, like, merge became more important because it me it's, it's like how I make a living. Right. And I'm supporting my family. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, I got to do that. Right. So... It made the band less important <laughs> and merge more important. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And fortunately, around the same time, or before then, merge had been growing um, in a way where, you know, we were able to buy this building and put our offices in here and hire more people. And, and we, you know, we had been putting out records that were doing better than right. before. Right. Um, But also, I and mean, it's interesting to think about, like, what all this means to her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, my parents weren't conservative. They were sort of like hippies. And I grew up not conservative. I have heard people say that if you're really liberal, your parent, your children are going to be grow up to be like Republicans just to spite you. Right, right. <laughs> And so, so yeah. sometimes I think about that, and I go like, "What is what is she gonna? How is she gonna react against all this?" Right, right. But right now she's into it. You know, mm -hmm. she likes that. She likes that I'm in a band. She likes seeing me play. She um, she loves X Hex. Yeah. Um. Every time they play, she wants to go see them. Uh huh. Me too. They're so great. <laughs> they are. Um. I, yeah, and it's funny, there's not that many bands that she's that mm -hmm. interested in. Right. Um, she's also gotten really into, like, Katy Perry and Taylor Swift, though. Yeah. This, you know, this is going to happen. Right, yeah. Um, I'm not against it, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah. I, I guess that I guess that's all I have to say about it. Mm-hmm. Um, was it something you thought about of like, can I have kids and still pursue music, or were you just gonna make it work no matter what? Or um, I guess when I got pregnant, it was, it was after we had decided to sort of take a break with Super Chunk. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it felt like an okay time. Mm -hmm. And I, I really didn't know if we would make any more records or not. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm in a pretty stable right. place right now. Mm -hmm. This will be, this will be okay. Right. Um, and my husband, he uh, he was a he was a touring sound guy. Mm -hmm. And after we had Nina, he went on one long tour and then realized that he didn't feel like he could do it anymore because he he didn't want to leave either mm -hmm. and miss. I mean, when they're young, they they change so fast. Like a few weeks, it's you know it's crazy what happens. Right. You know, they they go from not talking to talking or or. You know, they start crawling. Or, yeah. They're, they, they just change. Um, so he quit touring and actually wound up being the one to stay home with her mm. when, when I came back to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to do that. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm.
Do you want any water or anything? I am fine, thank you though. Alright. Um Okay, uh <laughs> this is one question. Has anyone ever asked like Mac or John or Jim what it's like to be a man in a band? <laughs> Just me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've been I've been asked that in so many interviews over so many years. Um and I think sometimes, like, during those interviews, I would then turn to them, them and go, like, I, what, you, what is it like for you right. <laughs> to be a man in a band? Right. Um, yeah, it's the dumbest question. <laughs> it's so terrible. No. No interviewer ever asked them that question. What has it been like getting that question so many times? Um, it's irritating. Um, and yet, but you know, it's funny how I think for a long time my standard answer was, you know, it's just like being a guy in a band. We're all, we're, you know, we're just a bunch of guys as far as I'm concerned, right. you know. Um, it's not like, you know, I carry my stuff. Right. <laughs> I carry more stuff than Mac does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think more recently, like I've 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 become. I feel like I've been giving that question sort of the wrong answer. Like mm. it, like in a in some ways, like I have noticed that but okay this may be it may be less of a gender issue and more of an introvert extrovert issue hmm. mac gets more credit for everything mm. than i do mm -hmm. and i but i think a lot of it has to do with him being more of having more of a public persona and being more mm -hmm. like good at talking right um and more a better self promoter mm -hmm. um and I think, you know, in Superchunk, people are more focused on him because he's the lead singer. Right. And, you know, he's an extrovert. And I think being a woman in the band made people notice me more mm -hmm. than if I was just a guy bass player. Right. They would care less. Right. Um, not that, my, you know, I feel like I should be noticed any more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, so, people are very focused on lead singers and extroverts. <laughs> <laughs> and being a woman means people look at you in a different way. Mm -hmm. You're more there's there's still in general more guys at shows than there are women, and you're being checked out. Mm -hmm. um, which, for the most part, doesn't impact me personally. Mm -hmm. Like I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, It's not like I feel like I need to respond to that by wearing revealing outfits or something, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's complicated. But yeah, gender, gender stuff is crazy. And, uh, you know, I feel like it's almost getting worse now. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's there's this n revival of feminism or something going on and I'm like I don't know what circles that's happening in <laughs> but like I look at like popular music right now people it's out of hand what people what women have to do to sell records you have to see their asses you know right. it's really like embarrassing mm -hmm. and not what I want my daughter mm -hmm. to see as like this is what this is what people do and this is what, as a woman, I'm expected to look like and how I should dress. Totally. It's, it's, um, it's, it's embarrassing. Times are crazy. Right.
Yeah. No, I know. It's interesting, too, because I was at the Slater Kenny show on Wednesday. Uh huh. And, you know, some guy's there and, like, calls me a bitch and he's, like, invading my space. And it's uh -huh. just like, you're at a Slater Kenny show. <laughs> uh huh. Like, if you show, You don't get it. Right. Like, you don't deserve. Like, you have to, like. Can we just go back to this whole girls to the front uh -huh. plan? Yeah. You know, because yeah. it feels like there is this kind of, like, okay, we did that. But it still seem it feels necessary to me, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's crazy. Um. How? What is it like having fans, and what is it like being on stage, and and knowing the kind of gendered crowd dynamics that can go on. Um. It's. It's weird because, you know, as far as the gendered crowd dynamics go, I feel like, you know, you can't have a lot of control over it. Sure. Or you wind up sounding like Ian, you know, like, which I think is awesome that he feels like he can just go like, hey, you, you're being an asshole. <laughs> Come up here, you know, right. or, what, or whatever. Right. Um, you stop doing that to that person. Right. But for the most part, it's really, it, you know, when I'm playing, I can't keep an eye on things that sure, well, sure. and also feel like I can ar articulately address mm -hmm. that issue, whatever it is. Yeah, totally. um, I think you know sometimes sometimes there'll be a couple of assholes at a show, but most, for the most part, I think that we we were lucky. You know, yeah, things were pretty good. Yeah. Um, But it does, what winds up happening very often is, you know, the guys are in the front and the girls have to be in the back and, or, or, or you know, if they don't want to get bounced around or totally. have their toes stepped on. Right. Which most girls don't want to have their toes stepped on. <laughs> right. Um, why, why are, why don't girls like having their toes stepped on as much as guys? I don't know. <laughs> we just don't. <laughs> We're just against it. Right. <laughs> Is it conditioning? Is that like, that's interesting to think about that. Like, my daughter is actually like, she's way more physical than I am right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like she, she, um, she can be rough. Mm -hmm. And I, and I find myself going like, Nina, that hurts. Stop it. And right. like, but I feel like if she's okay with getting bruises, it's fine. Right. As long as she's not hurting other people. Right. I don't want to suppress her physicality. Right. Yeah. It's tricky. It is. Yeah. Like she, because right now she's so physical, she might in a weird way really like being in the front of a crowd at this, you know. Right. And that jostling. Mm-hmm. She, but she's short right now, so she might that part might not be good. <laughs> yeah. But she likes bumping against people. Uh huh. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Do you define yourself in terms of like a regional identity? Like, do you see yourself as a southerner? I do. I am a southerner. I have lived in the South all my life. I think that like people have certain stereotypical ideas of what the uh, you know what a southerner is, mm -hmm. but I am a southerner. Mm -hmm. I come from the South, you know, my, my mom's from New Jersey, but, and for that reason, she, she was always on us about like, she would suppress our accent. Yeah. Um, yeah. it's, she didn't entirely manage to do it, but I don't have a strong Southern accent. Um, but my dad, I mean, he's basically a redneck, mm -hmm. an Island redneck, which is different than like other kinds <laughs> of rednecks, but, right. but, um, He, you know, he's a good person, and, and, uh, I don't know, I, I, yeah, I identify as a Southerner, mm -hmm. and I like being down here, I like living here, it's easy, there's space, it's beautiful, yeah, it's good. <laughs> um, what does being a Southerner mean to you? It means, it means getting to live down here where it's beautiful. Right. 
warm <laughs> and weather. Warm weather yeah. And and um, I think actually being in the South was really instrumental to the development of Merge and Super Chunk mm -hmm. because we lived in this place where it wasn't really expensive to live. Right. Um, and we could sort of live more on the edge and you know we didn't have to earn as much money right to be able to live comfortably here and to have enough money to put into pressing seven inches mm -hmm. and um, sometimes people would when we were early in like I don't know once people started hearing about the band they would be like why don't you move to a big city like you should move to New York and we'd just be like, why would we do that? That sounds terrible. <laughs> like then, like you have to rent a practice space. You have to haul your stuff there every time you want to practice. Mm -hmm. We're here, like basically, we could just put our stuff somewhere and leave it there. Right. In our house, we could rent houses big enough where we could just have a room where we would practice. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, I don't. And and obviously you don't this this opportunity does not exist only in the south. Sure. There's rural places everywhere where you can do this, but right. but um, I guess here also specifically in in Chapel Hill, Durham, Raleigh, we have a kind of a great little microcosm mm -hmm. of of you know there's three universities. So there's a lot of young people interested in music. There's three great college radio stations, mm. um, and good rock clubs that have been, you know, supported by there being these colleges here. Mm -hmm. um, and all that wouldn't, you know, doesn't happen just anywhere. Right. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think being a southerner, it partly, it partly means you try to always be friendly. <laughs> that's part of it, and and that's also a, you know a nice advantage to living here. Is people generally like are nice and mm -hmm. smile and say hi. Um, you say thank you when you check out at the grocery store. You know, <laughs> stuff right. like that, uh, that I think is, isn't common everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think it just leads, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good place to live. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's laid back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not fast paced. Unless you choose to make it that way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about your experience with hyperacusis? Yes. Um, let's see. I, pretty early on, I can't remember exactly when I started wearing earplugs when we were playing, but it was pretty early. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe in... I probably started wearing them in maybe 94. Maybe we had been a band for like five years by the time I started wearing them, which is already too late. <laughs> but um, I just, I felt like Mac, Mac has always played really loud. His amp has always been turned way up. And, and I found myself constantly like trying to turn his amp down or like angling it away from me. Right. Um, when I start wearing earplugs, even the, and and they 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 kind of um, take away some of the high end, which if I think at first people perceive that as like it takes away the fun. Mm. <laughs> it and it, it sounds different and right. it's it doesn't sound as good, but also it doesn't feel good when your ears hurt the next day, right? Or you f you hear that strange high pitched sound yep. because you subjected yourself to too much loudness the night before. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I started wearing earplugs all the time, like, you know, when we play, when we were at shows. Um, so I don't know if I have some sort of hereditary 
hearing vulnerability, but I feel like my hearing a few years ago, I you know, I, I noticed it feels like, you know, it's getting worse and um, I became more sensitive to high pitched noises and stuff. But I was at a, a <clears throat> an outdoor show and the Love Language were playing, a band that's on Merge, and um, whoever was running the PA was really bad at it. It sounded terrible, and it was way, like, they had it turned up too high, and it was over, over, you know, blowing out the speakers. Right. Kind of. um, and the show was over, and I went up to say, hey, that was great, see you later, and I had forgotten to bring my earplugs. Mm. And I was, so during the show, I was way in the back, like, mm -hmm. trying to stay away from it. But they started... While I was up there, they decided to start playing again. And when they started, it was so loud. I feel like in that moment, something this ear, hmm. something happened to it. And, and that's where the hyperacusis came from. Right. The hyperacusis, um, I, 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 have, I have tinnitus also from mm -hmm. just long-term hearing damage. Mm -hmm. But I feel like hyperacusis my hyperacusis started from one specific moment. Mm, mm -hmm. um, and uh, right when it happened, like, I, I, I was like, my ear sounds strange. You know, it's like, right. it, it's, it made this kind of like, <sighs> like uh, feedback, mm. staticky kind of noise. Um, and I didn't, it wasn't that much of an issue until we, Super Chunk, put out Majesty Shredding in 2010, and we started touring again. Mm -hmm. um, was it 2010? I think it was 2010. That's what Majesty says. <laughs> <laughs> 2010. Um, mm -hmm. And I noticed while, while we were doing, as we were doing shows, I was like, my like, I my my ears are too noisy, and like. Even with my earplugs in, when we're when we're playing, like things hurt, and I just realized, like you know, after finishing the touring for that record, I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't mm -hmm. want to. I don't want to. My band, you know, Super Chunk is loud. They play loud. I've been asking them for years to turn down. Right. They won't do it. Yeah. Um, so after, I mean, really like. I, uh, I guess like, I could have, I could have thought about quitting a long time ago, mm -hmm. but I didn't because I didn't want, I didn't want it to end. Right. And I felt I, you know, like I said, the playing for people is so gratifying. It's really hard to give up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was scared to give it up, mm -hmm. but I decided I had to because of my child. Yeah. I want to be able to hear her for the rest of my life. And and um, it, I, I just feel like if I keep subjecting myself to overly loud situations, I, I won't mm -hmm. be able to. Um, but hyperacusis is interesting. Have you, have you read about hyperacusis A at all? A little bit, yeah. I've, I, I like... I guess I, my case is really not that bad. Mm -hmm. Some people have it really bad to this point where they they are afraid to go out anywhere because right. anything can set it off. It doesn't like it can be a sudden sharp noise and you don't know you right. can't predict when that's going to happen. Sure. Um, and there are people who don't want to leave their apartments and who eat off paper plates with plastic cutlery because they don't they can't stand the noise right. of a piece of silverware hitting a plate. Mm -hmm. um, I am not that bad. Yeah. Sometimes people's voices get too loud. Mm -hmm. Like if people get excited and start kind of talking loud, mm -hmm. I find that I want to put in my earplugs, you mm -hmm. know, because <laughs> my ear starts hurting. Right. Um, but I, I feel like it's it, it was the right decision to decide not to play with Super Chunk anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about it and happy and relieved. Yeah. And I'm so glad that, that, that it didn't mean 
that the band had to quit, you right. know, because they love they love it, you know, mm -hmm. they love playing, and people, our audience. Love the band, and right. I don't want I don't want to take anything away from anybody. Um, it's great that it worked out that Jason Narducci could fill in for me, mm -hmm. be my substitute because he's great and everybody gets along with him. Yeah. Um, and I'm and and we talked a lot when 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 we were trying to decide who we should ask. We talked a lot about like it would be really weird if it was a girl. <laughs> <laughs> We can't. We sort right. of can't do that. Right. Yeah. That would be just so awkwardly like. Well, it's a girl. Right. <laughs> she doesn't know how to play bass either. <laughs> We're just gonna start over again. That would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> so, a lot of music communities are not that great at making space for disabled or differently abled people to participate. Um, so as someone with hyperacusis, do you see, like, ways of modifying music faces to accommodate? That's a good question. Um, I have not been able to come up with a good idea to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, f I feel like, um, shows have gotten way, they just keep getting louder. Right. Um, and it, they didn't used to be so loud. I... I think it's unfortunate that people feel like shows have to be so loud that like mm -hmm. everybody there should really be wearing earplugs. Right. Um, what's the point in that? <laughs> um, I, there are some places, there are some cities where there are decibel limits. Mm -hmm. I don't know how well they're enforced. Right. It doesn't seem like they're enforced very well. Right. Um, but that's also really hard to tell when you're on stage. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's probably the best solution is to actually have decibel limits and actually enforce them. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, people in the industry, sound people, are going to be really against that because mm -hmm. people have gotten sort of addicted to this level of volume and the kind of physicality of it. Right. Um, because it does, it feels more powerful. Totally. Um, but it's really bad for people's ears. Mm -hmm. Uh, but other than that, like, I don't know what we can do. Right. But, like, it, it, it concerns me that people's hearing is getting damaged that way. But also, like, these days there's so many people going around with headphones and earbuds mm -hmm. on from an early age. And I think that's bad, too. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that can really damage your hearing in ways that you don't realize. Like, mm -hmm. you get used, your ears get used to a certain volume and you don't. And sustained volume is bad for you, too. Right. Um, and I think, you know, kids don't think about that. Mm -hmm. Young people don't think about that. I think a lot, you know, people think they are immortal and will not be damaged. Right. And um, it's hard to think about the long term when mm -hmm. you're young. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Look out! <laughs> I'll be sure to wear earplugs. Yeah, I, I really, I mean, I think everybody needs to have earplugs on them all the time. It's right. crazy. And at, at, you know, I think that, like, clubs at least should always have earplugs that they can right. sell or give out to people if they want them. Yeah. Um, that's what, I mean, my small gesture towards, like, please don't hurt your ears. At, at Merge Fest this year, we got, a, I ordered a bunch of earplugs and we gave them out. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to make everybody wear earplugs. <laughs> I'm sure they didn't. Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. Um, so this is actually going back to something we were talking about way in the very beginning. Um, you mentioned kind of uh, the trauma you experienced as a child in Arkansas and saying that you felt that you didn't really get over that from the ages of 8 to 28. Mm -hmm. um, what was it that happened at 28 that, was there a healing moment that happened? I don't think there was a particular moment. I think it was, it was just kind of, um, it was like becoming sort of more conscious. Mm -hmm. um, somehow, I, like, I was, 
I, after having a period of, you know, being independent from my parents and um, having control over my own life and being in the band and, and running Merge um, for a while, Maybe it wasn't 28. It might have been a little younger. I, at some point, I decided like I wanted to see a therapist, mm -hmm. and I found a therapist. I can't remember how, but it was terrible. She was a, she was not a good therapist. She was. I still haven't found a good therapist in my life. Yeah. Um, it's hard. Uh, she would. I would tell her about my life, and she would cry. <laughs> So I felt bad for her, <laughs> and I was just like, oh, oh no. no, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, boy. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, and like, I, I have always been really good about keeping appointments and being on time and stuff, and I would forget my appointments with her somehow. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and then at some point I realized, like, okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta break up with her. This is not right. okay for me. Yeah. I'm paying her way too much money to, like, not want to go. Right. <laughs> totally. Um, but but I I guess I just kind of like it's hard it's hard to figure out like trauma like that it it you, it's never gonna go away right and and I have always well maybe not always but maybe part of it was part of my sort of healing or becoming more turning back outward more again mm -hmm. um, had to do with being able to talk about it mm -hmm. without it making me uncomfortable yeah um, for a long time I think I felt like it was something I had to hide like it was some shame mm -hmm. on me or my family or something that this bad thing had happened to us right um, where you know obviously it wasn't our fault uh, But talking about it with people and telling people about it, and and uh, I think I think somehow that is therapeutic and mm -hmm. has been therapeutic and is is has um, helped me get past it. But but it's not like you know the I was thinking about it all the time or reliving it all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, but it's, it's like it set off this animal instinct sure. to, to protect myself. Mm -hmm. Was there ever any closure with that with your family? Like did they ever catch the guy or did you just move and, and that was that? They caught the guy. Um, he left fingerprints all over the house. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, it turns out, yeah, he was a serial rapist. He, he was uh, he, he went to prison just on our case. Mm -hmm. And apparently, like they had these other cases in case mm -hmm. he ever came up for parole, like right. that, that they could go, like you mm -hmm. know, no, he should not be let out. Right. We'll just bring these out. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how, you know, I'm I'm not yeah. real up on how the legal system works, or if you know. But I think that he, my understanding is, he won't ever come up for parole because he did so much right. harm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny how like that for me. I mean, I guess I guess like I I didn't go to court. I didn't have to testify. Mm -hmm. My brother and I didn't didn't go at all. Um, my sister, my older sister, did. Mm -hmm. And my, is it just the three of you? Uh, uh huh. Mm -hmm. And my and my parents. Um, <clears throat> so so the 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 whole the I guess I was young enough. The whole court part of it didn't give me any sense of closure, right. you know? Right. Um, so, 
I, you know, I don't know. I've never thought about closure mm -hmm. with it, you know. When it was over, I guess that was the closure. Right. <laughs> when he left. Right. <laughs> um, but I hold it against Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Arkansas. I just like, Little Rock is a terrible city. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I have one more question, but before that, is there anything else you want to talk about? Not that I can think of at the moment. Okay. Um, so my last question is, what's been your proudest moment? Oh, geez. Um, that's a tough question. A moment. I'm really proud that I have such an awesome kid. Mm -hmm. But that's, yeah, that's, I guess, um, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, there's so many, I feel like I've been a part of so many great things and so many great, gotten to work with so many great people. Mm -hmm. um, It's one, I mean, it's one of the great things about Merge, for me, is it's such an honor to work with the bands that we work with, mm -hmm. that they trust us and that they want to work with us, and, right. and um, we have such great relationships mm -hmm. with, with, with these people, and, and um, but I can't, I can't put my finger on a moment. Yeah. Uh, like, stuff that I think maybe some people would say were proud moments I don't care about. Like, winning a Grammy. Like, I don't care. Right. That doesn't mean anything to me. Uh huh. Um, it's more about people and, like, we have a great staff here like mm -hmm. I, I'm proud that we have grown to a point where we can employ these people and mm -hmm. and we haven't had to lay them off you right. know <laughs> so far right um uh it it's um it's a it's a big responsibility and I feel mm -hmm. like we've taken our responsibilities very seriously and done a good job of being responsible mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm proud of our responsibility. <laughs> very rock and roll of you. <laughs> I'm not very rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> no. And honestly, like, I think also Super Chunk is not very rock and roll. We're the biggest bunch of squares. <laughs> um, we, like, I mean, there have certainly been moments where we've drank too much on tour. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. But, like, n we're, you know, no drugs, no, really, like, if there were things that happened with, with the opposite sex or sex at all on tour, they were very few and far between, mm -hmm. um, and were very, you know, kept, kept separate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but for the most part, it was really just like, we're this little family touring around, mm -hmm. um, That's all I got. That's all right. What's been What's been your silliest moment? Do you have any, like, the silliest thing that happened when you're on tour or? Hmm. There were a lot of silly moments. Let's see if I can remember any of them. Um. Well, touring in general is silly. Playing in a band is silly. I mean, I know, like, people love it, and it's really gratifying in that way, and it feels important. But also, it's the most ridiculous job in the world, right? right? <laughs> like, you're you're driving around, you're taking your stuff out of the van, you're setting it up, and you're 
jumping up and down and playing songs for people and then you take it all down and you put it back in the van and you drive some more and you do it again. Mm -hmm. I mean it's just like it's I like there there were times on tour that I just felt like a performing monkey. Right. Um but you could call this silly or pathetic. When we put out, let's see, it was 2001, and 9/11 had happened, and our 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 record came out shortly after that, and um, we we had this plan to you know do our touring and sort of get it over with in a really f compact way, mm -hmm. and we went and did Europe first, and then came back to the United States. We were home for like three days before we left and started our U.S. tour and it was just exhausting and, and we had um, long drives, no days off and we got to LA and we're playing this show at the knitting factory there and I fell asleep on stage while I was playing. <laughs> wow. I had one of those moments like you have like uh, have you ever been driving and you're you're trying to stay awake and you're right. like, you right. know, you sort of nod off for a second? Right. That happened to me while I was playing. <laughs> Did you actually fall asleep or just? It was more just nodding, nodding off. Nodding off. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and like I said, we don't do drugs. I, you know, it was right. totally just like I was tired. Yeah. And it was a it was a weird, depressing time too. Like touring right around then was was people were people were freaked out. Right. They were sad. They weren't going out. They yeah. like everything felt very somber. Yeah. Um But I think it's yeah. I'm not making any excuses for falling asleep on stage, but I did. That's pretty funny. But God, there's so many silly moments. I really wish I had a notebook where I just had all the silly moments. Right. <laughs> so I could <laughs> So I could remember them all on call. For sure. <clears throat> I can't remember any other ones right now. I am bad on the spot. That's fine. <laughs> uh, okay, so any anything else you want to say or anything before we shut the camera off? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, I think thanks. it's good for now. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> If you think of more things, let me know next time I'm coming by. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for doing this. No problem. Yeah. Right. My pleasure. <laughs>